I got 99 problems, but no, nah, they all pretty much supply chain related. Let's get to it. Welcome, 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 another fabulous episode of IBF On Demand. I'm your one thing that is not a problem host, Eric Wilson. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. Thanks for the followers and subscribes. Uh, like I said, you can find me on LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you get this podcast. A very special thank you to Arkiva, driving business transformation by solving what others cannot. Thank you, Arkiva, longtime sponsor, wonderful company. Check them out, please, as well. We do have a lot coming up in the 2024 season. So check out IBF.org, all the conferences, all the events that's coming up. Uh, besides that as well, I'm going to be at some other conferences. So if you want to keep informed what conferences I'm going to be at, Make sure you find me on LinkedIn, and one of the places I'm going to be is in March. I'm actually going to be at the University of Kentucky Supply Chain Forum, so find out more about that coming up soon. Pat Bauer, a legend friend of mine in this industry, once told me that supply chains like running around with a fire hose on your shoulder. Well, not only that, but I would say the importance of the fire that you're putting out constantly keeps changing as well. I mean, in 2000s, the big topics were outsourcing, changing consumer, and the need for POS data. Well, 2023, the big topics are nearshoring. And guess what? The changing consumer and the need for different external type of data, some more explanatory variables that we need to go after now. 2019, there was a large survey with top executives, the number one initiative for executives. I mean, over 80% of, of executives reported their number one initiative that year was risk management in 2019. How did that work out for them? I hate the word new norm, but as much as things change, other things, they seem to stay the same. And for supply chain managers, they get caught smack in the middle of it all. That's the reason why I'm bringing on today's special guest, Stephen. Stephen is Professor of Operations of Supply Chain Management at Michigan State University. His research interests include performance measurements, strategic supply chain, and management standards. Recently, he has accepted a joint appointment with the University of Newcastle, Australia, where he now occupies a global innovation chair in supply chain management. He's the board of directors and uh, member of ASCM, Academic Society. He's a legend in the supply chain, speaking at numerous conferences, and understands this field better than anyone from a practical practitioner perspective. Please help me welcome Stephen. So welcome, Stephen. I'm excited to have you on my show today. Thank you for having me. Well, one of the things that, you know, we talked about the pendulum of supply chain, and it really does seem like a pendulum of supply chain. I mean, inventory was bad, then it's good again, then it's bad again. I'm really not sure where we are in that pendulum right now. But that's just one example. It really thinks everything seems to be that pendulum. I mean, is that what we're seeing? And, and the bigger question, is that ever going to change? Well, okay, well, you've asked really an interesting question. The pendulum concept is we seem to be attracted by bright, shiny new things. And what happens is often we're given a concept which seems at first glance to make sense. And then everyone gets excited, and then suddenly we start to see the limitations. And we've seen this pendulum affect our field for a long time. Uh, when I first came to Michigan State, we, in the early, late 1980s, early 1990s, we saw the concept of computer grade manufacturing. And people talked about how we're going to automate everything and how we're going we're to need fewer people and we can build anything the customer wants. That disappeared. And that disappeared because we suddenly understood that technology is only one part of the solution. So you brought the issue of inventory. Many people got excited about inventory because they saw it as a waste. It consumes resources, it consumes floor space, it hides our problems. But the reality is what 
we're starting to understand is inventory, you buy inventory because it provides a function. If you don't want the inventory, you get rid of the function. So what I'm getting here is that uh, the pendulum concept says every a lot of people are going to get attracted to bright, shiny things. Supply chain managers have got to be able to say, essentially, but. And that's critical. And too often we don't say but. Um, and the result is we have a lot of expectations and a lot of software and hardware sales are made and suddenly it didn't deliver the goods. Yeah. You, you say, that, you know, yes, but. Well, the other way to look at it, they don't say no a lot either. Oh, that's a great question. Let me tell you why that's a great question. And last day, last week, we were having a conversation because we have a company that's going to be coming in February. And they had indicated that they wanted us to restructure our program. And one of the questions that was asked by Dave Freyer, who's the director of executive development programs here at State, is we're, at, we're being asked a question. How do you effectively say no? Now, think about that. At first glance, isn't that a simple question? Like, it's no. Like, what more do you need? <laughs> and what he, was, what he was getting to is the fact that in the conversation, we found out that there are four foundations for no. Why? Uh, okay, understand. I'm a professor. I'll complicate anything when the bir- until the birds come home. The first foundation is you need data. That is, if you say no, the answer is going to come back to you. Why? Have the data. The second reason, you have to have the relationship. If you trust the person at the other side and I say no, that person is willing to say, okay, what's going on? Versus if you want my business, you'll do it. The third foundation is alternative slash actions. When we say no, it's no, but it's not. It's we cannot do that, but we can do this. So your responsibility is alternatives, options. And the fourth issue is accountability. It's not enough to end, but when you finish the discussion, you have to say something to the effect, okay, we've agreed to this, we're going to be held accountable. You've agreed to that, you're going to have accountable. If you don't have those four foundations, saying no is a useless exercise. One of the things that traditionally we saw was you mentioned the inventory. Supply chains were traditionally about cutting cost, efficiency. Lean was the was the thing. Is that changing now? And where else should we or are we starting to see focus now? Okay, what you're really getting into is something I saw way back. Oh, almost now 13 years. And what that was, was that if you looked at supply chain, there are really six fundamental outcomes. You know, like they're almost like pure outcomes. They're efficiency, responsiveness, sustainability, resilience, innovation, security. And security is both product and information. What we're finding out is those six outcomes are still there. Previously, we focused on cost. It's the most easily measured. Now we're starting to recognize that cost is no longer enough. Responsiveness is becoming important. Uh, and that means, that's one reason you're starting to see people say, inventory is good because it enables us to respond. The other thing you're starting to see is we're starting to see security is important. That's forcing us to understand that how we deal with the supply chain. And one of the things that we try to emphasize in the presentation is, Most supply chain managers are good at managing the silo. Today's supply chain manager has to manage at the edge, which means they have to manage the interfaces with marketing, with top management. They have to manage the interface with the supplier. We have to present in the firm a balanced perspective where we balance the kind of emphasis on cost with recognizing that once you've pushed costs, sometimes you have to be responsive. The things we do to reduce cost may not be the same things we would do to reduce, to improve responsiveness. Now, if if I remember, uh, thinking back to the presentation, you mentioned the supply chain managers. I think you mentioned their roles and what you just talked about, their translators is I think the way you kind of put it. Is that correct? Yeah, and in fact, one of the most 
I think the diagram that got most people excited, it's a strange looking diagram. It looks like a bullseye. And in the bullseye, you had three circles. At the heart of the bullseye, you had the supply chain manager. And what you did is imagine that that bullseye has uh, you, you at the circle, the center, then there's a ring outside, and then there's an outer ring. And through it, it was an X. And what that X really said is, if you think of the top, that's your superior. You think of the bottom, that's your subordinates. You think of the segment to the left, that's your suppliers, and you think of the segment to the right, that's your customer. The inner circle are your immediate customers, your immediate superiors, etc. The outer are your ultimates. And the point we tried to raise in the presentation is an effective supply chain manager is really a translator. They essentially translate what we do in the on the shop floor, the capabilities we've invested in, and we express that to top management so they understand things they can and can't do. We also express essentially that to our suppliers, and we express that to our customers. So what we're doing is we are moving information, we're educating people. And one of the things we pointed out is two things. Number one, we have to focus on performance measures because those are communication devices. So the first thing is you have to communicate through me through performance and the through measures. And the second thing is when you think of yourself as a translator, a lot of the practices we see in many companies have to go away. Uh, one of the things we found is that you have to get close to your customer so you understand what they want. You have to get close to your suppliers so you understand what they can do. You have to educate your superiors about what you can and can't do. And you also have to be able to communicate to your subordinates about what it is we're being asked to do to the process. So it's a very different approach dynamic now uh so that kind of what you meant by managing at the edges of that superiors upstream downstream subordinates you have your inner and then you're managing at the edge okay so it makes a lot more sense now yeah but you see that's why if you think of it uh too often when we go to an asm conference we talk about managing within the silo mm -hmm. that's not that's not where our biggest benefit is yeah. it's managing at the intersection with engineering with accounting, with the customer, with top management. And those are a new set of skills that we've got to teach our supply chain executives. Okay, so it's interesting you, you kind of talked about the new set of skills. And I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth because I heard a lot of different I've been to like four conferences in the last four weeks. Uh, I forget which <laughs> came from where. So I apologize if it wasn't you. But I think That's you okay. made the comment about what we're teaching right now is pretty much pretty much obsolete in five years. I think that came from you. I heard you say that. Uh, whether it's technology or, the, or a lot of the things that we're teaching, if that is true, if, if you don't agree, then, then tell me what your opinion is on that. But if you agree with that, then how do we prepare the people you're teaching right now at, at Michigan or how the current workforce? How do we give them these skill sets you're talking about? Okay, what you're getting into is one of the okay, one of the issues I encountered some years ago. I was on the board of directors of Apex, and what I started to notice is we you teach really two things to people: you teach content, and then you teach skills. And what I mean, like critical thinking, uh, how to interface with people, how to present arguments. Content in today's environment is changing rapidly. Uh, think about what's happening in IoT or artificial intelligence. It seems every time you turn around, someone is changing the field. If you teach content alone, then you expect a high rate of obsolescence because ch things change. Uh, you know, for example, even something as simple as a connector. Apple used to have its lightning connector. Now it's become obsolete. It's being replaced by USB-C. Suddenly, all the ones that you've had with the lightning connectors, guess what? Got to get a new set. So what do you teach? You teach two things. You teach management skills, and you also teach the art of keeping current. 
understanding the events, what's going on, understanding the challenges, being aware of them. Um, and that's one of the reasons that as we started to look at the manager, we started to find that in today's environment, today's supply chain manager is really a different creature. They have to manage fast. And managing fast in some ways is analogous to being like a jet fighter pilot. What does that mean? Um, if you have a, if, think of it, if you're a jet fighter pilot and planes are coming at you, let's say 1,500 miles per hour, you're closing at 3,000 miles per hour. You cannot afford to kind of sit back and wait. So what we started to see is a new approach. So the issue that I was raising is number one, focusing on content alone is not enough. We've got to teach these skills. And one of the skills is how to be a manager. The second skills skill is how to be cynical. And the third skill is how to keep current and how to understand that, you know, as like as one of the things I pointed out is that I have a law. I have, I have about 40 Melnix maxims that I've developed from my 44 years here at State. Yeah, I've been here that long. Prison sentences are shorter. Anyway. Sounds like there's a book the coming up here with all these and eventually, huh? <laughs> Uh, look, I've written 23 books. They have never made me a fortune. <laughs> Screw it. Anyway, so here's the here's the point. One of the one of the maxims is at any one point in time, there's always one best system. Unfortunately, over time, that system changes. So what does that mean about what, seriously? So what does that mean for you? We've got to teach our managers to be able to under to keep what's good from the old systems, but to be willing to say. It's time for us to move to something different. We don't want to be the laggards. And you were the one that made that comment then in five years, most of the content's going to be obsolete. So it was you that made that comment then as well. Yeah. <laughs> so that, I, mean, so we, 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 I heard critical thinking skills in there. I heard, yep. you know, kind of that being a skeptic. That was one of the things yes. you said in there. I mean, you want to expand because that one kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit. I, I, that was an interesting one. Okay. Well, remember, uh, being a skeptic is there, there's an old Americans have a great saying, and that is, "I'm from Missouri." You know what the rest of that says? Show me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What being a skeptic is is to understand that every we we always are given the latest silver bullet. Uh, September 25th, I was in Chicago, and I was at a conference, which was put on by the province of Quebec. It was called it was called M Cargo M and the, the state of Illinois and the French government. And everyone was talking about artificial intelligence, how it's going to save everything. And one of the things I've learned for many years is that technology is not enough by itself. Every, you know, like Dan Steele, who was a, a consultant, wrote a book some years ago, and I loved one of the comments he said. He said, when, te when it comes to technology, 95% of all technology is irrelevant. It comes, it goes, no one cares. Of the remaining 5%, 4.999% are minor. The 0 0.001 is significant. So in most cases, you've got to be able to look at technology and say, so what? What, is it what capabilities is it enabling me to have? And the other reason you've got to become skeptical is because when we look at a technology, how we use it initially is not the way we wind up using it. So people learn about technologies. And the third reason you've got to be a skeptic is because, understand, hardware and software companies are in the business of selling you hardware and software. And you've got to be able to say to them, what is it that you're enabling me to do? And answer, you know, asking three questions. Can you enable me to do something faster, better, cheaper, lowest level? Can you enable me to address a customer need, which either we or the competition are addressing poorly, or can you help me identify and address a customer need that neither I nor the competition is addressing? So don't tell me about the technology. Tell me how it links to that. That's being a skeptic. I love that. And focus on the problem, not necessarily the solution right now as well. Oh, of course. Yes. Of course. 
So if I kind of wanted to put together what we've talked about so far, when it comes to the manager, we said critical thinking, you said be a skeptic, manage at the edges, uh, kind of that fast decision making as well. Um, The other one I I had down was resistant, resist the squeaky wheel. You mean, last last question, if you want to touch on that one real quick, I mean, think that would be valuable as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, What that really gets into is, One of my laws is the law of criticality. And that law simply says not everything is equally important. Not all customers are equally important. Not all suppliers are equally important. Not all processes are equally important. So the reason you have to understand is that you have to understand who your key customer is. Far too often, we don't do that. I mean, I have been in companies and I've asked, who's your key customer? And I've had some companies tell me if, that essentially it's anyone who pays the bill. And, you know, my, my first reaction to that is to, I have this desire to slap my forehead and go, no, it's not. And if you don't know who your key customer is, you tend to respond to either a customer who's immediate, internal, or a customer who complains a lot. And in many cases, the customers who complain a lot may not they're essentially the the karens and kens of the supply (laughs) chain world they're not important to you and you've got to have that and that's a critical decision one of the things i've been blessed being at michigan state is i've had a chance to work with some very good companies and one of the things you that differentiates a good company from a mediocre company is not the technology it's not the people it's that they understand who their key customer is. In our experience at Michigan State, when we teach process thinking, which embodies the law of criticality, we look for one of six traits. Okay. Is it a bottleneck? Is it visible to the customer? If it's visible to the customer, it affects moments of truth, how the company sees you. Is it a core competency? Is it an area of highest variance? If variance goes up, output goes down, lead time goes up. Does it consume the most resources? And finally, is the feeder. See, that's what a supply chain manager does. They look and they say, that's the law of criticality. Here's its implementation. So instead of me responding to everyone, I'm going to say, do you have one or more of those traits? You don't. Thank you. You're not important. It, you're not going to say that, but essentially yeah. you're going to say you're secondary. We'll get. We, we'll work with you, and that's what the manager has to do. And that's one reason when we talked about the emerging supply chain manager, we talked about a person who embraces complexity, eliminates complication. A person who embraces robustness and recognizes optimality is something that's taught in well-known Eastern business schools. And finally, they are always outside in versus inside out. They always begin with the customer and then say, how can we change what we're doing, the fit? And they understand that if the customer is willing to pay for it, we'll give it. By the way, you want to hear something really absurd? Sure. Starbucks is now starting to recognize it's introduced too much complexity into their coffee. <laughs> too many options there, huh? <laughs> oh, you want to? Okay, here, seriously. They did a study. Have you ever had a, ca- a coffee, la- a, ca- a cafe latte, latte from Starbucks? I'm more of a Dunkin' person, but yes, I've been to Starbucks. Okay, all before. right, all right, all right. So you're a Dunkin'. <laughs> what a name, Dunkin' Donuts. Anyway, uh, <laughs> do you realize that Star- Starbucks now is finding out that customers are complaining because of waiting times? They did a study. Do you want to know something that's fascinating? How many different combinations did they find you could make using a coffee latte? Oh, I can imagine. Oh, take a guess. This is really, (laughs) really absurd. Oh, I'm I'm sure it's an absurd number. That's why I couldn't even guess at it. (laughs) Oh, take a guess. Take a guess. Come on. I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, You've been doing that to me. Let's, let's go with 500,000 combinations. If only. <laughs> Are you ready for the number? 
I'm ready. In, ex in excess of 300 billion combinations. <laughs> So I wouldn't even come close to those numbers. No, but seriously, now you can start to see that this is what the supply chain manager does. We accept complexity, but then we turn around and tell marketing, uh, do you know what the implication of that's going to be for customer wait time? Yeah. Because with 300 billion combinations, guess what problem Starbucks is now faced by? Customers, Customers are not too. wanting to wait. That's right. See, that's what I mean. They're going to Duncan. <laughs> All right, you win. Anyway, but that's what I mean by by supplier by supply chain managers are the interpreters. They are the ones who translate. Well, uh, it was a great talking with you. I think the last thing you had, or the last quote that I had from you was that remember to have fun we're not accountants i mean I, I think that's the best quote you have there so far when it comes to supply chain managers and what we do for a living <laughs> well it, it is and let me tell you why um we every day think of it because the technology changes because the environment changes because the competition changes because strategies evolve we're faced by new problems we are not we are not people who live in a static world. We don't worry about fast B, we don't worry about gap. We worry about the changing world. So in contrast to everyone else, we deal with so much if you are an effective supply chain manager, your world is one that's exciting, it's challenging, it keeps you on the ball. And to yep. me, that's one reason I said, and that's why I'm a founding member of the Society for the Prevention of Accountancy. Our <laughs> motto is a, tar a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yep. So have fun. We're not accountants. And any accountants that's watching, sorry, not sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. It, 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 was, it was a great conversation. I wish we could do it. And I'm sure we'll probably do it again sometime. Uh, you should, because to be honest, what's happening is, as we st we're starting to, the field is changing. So, for example, uh, one of the things you might even think about talking is, here's a question I'll give you. How do we create an environment where we get our the supply chain managers to become more of a second order thinking? Not simply at the superficial level, but digging underneath so that they can show people the relationships. Because supply chain managers, if you're good, you have to be, by yeah. definition, a system thinker. Yeah, and the problem is pe too many people are linear thinkers, transactional thinkers. They don't think in the ecosystem they, they live in, and yeah. that's, that's the problem. And that's the issue. And they give supply chain a bad name because mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't – they, instead of helping organizations improve the top line, they seem to think that their concept is to improve the bottom line through cost reduction. Uh, do you remember a guy named like Tom Peters, 1980s? Yeah. To, yeah. He used yeah. to be a business writer, and one of the comments he made has always kept with me. He said, no firm became great by cutting costs. Yeah. So but at the same time, through the 80s and 90s, we were beat over the head with cost, 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 cost. And that's because we never were able to show people that a lot of the times what they were dealing with were symptoms that reflected yes. their actions. That that's why, go back to that model, the bullseye. We educate, we translate, we communicate, we help the organization achieve the vision. An effective yeah. supply chain manager is one who helps create value, which is what the key customer expects what we promise, and what the system, which is what we do, can deliver are aligned. So great. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. It was, was fun. I enjoyed this. Yes, it was fun. So I'll talk at you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Things have changed, and like you just heard, they're going to continue to change. That's the, that's the one constant we have, is the change in the content that we're dealing with. And like it or not, there's a new normal. But guess what? Tomorrow morning, there's going to be another new normal out there. It's going to continue to change. As supply chain management matures, its practitioners 
must start to think differently. That was the key I hope that you got from today's talk with Stephen. Companies have to invest more in tech forward, data driven processes, and, and, and that is true. But they also must continue to invest in continuing learning and continue to invest in the people as well. They need to develop a strategy that will carry them into the future. Yes, but they also need a workforce that can adapt to the changes that see and a changing workforce that is carries them into the future as well. Well, that's a wrap. Thankfully, I'm doing this now and just helping others solve their problems and eliminate noise and focus on their problems instead of being a practitioner. I kind of like the seat I'm in now with everything you're facing out there. But if there is something you want to hear about and talk about, please let me know. My name is Eric Wilson. This is IBF On Demand. You can find me at eric at ibf.org. That's eric at ibf.org. I want to thank Arkiva for driving business transformation by solving what others cannot. Thank you, Arkiva. And as I mentioned, the 2024 season is out now at ibf.org. You can see the whole season. But there is a lot of other conferences going on. Uh I talked to Stephen is from Michigan State University. There's a lot of universities doing a lot of great things. And and they always are looking for contributions from practitioners and people from the real world to come in and help them. I'm on the board of advisors for the University of Kentucky. We actually have a conference coming up in March, a supply chain forum. That's just one. There's other universities doing something very similar. Look at universities in your area. Can you get involved? Can we help? teach some of the other than content, some of those skills that Stephen mentioned today. Can we bring in how we see things changing and we can start adapting the universities to what we see? Because they need our help as much as we need them to provide quality candidates in the future. So remember, as much as things change, even in the new normal, it will always still be important to wash your hands.